Hi everyone, I'm Laura. Welcome back to another of my videos on IB psychology. And today we're still looking at the biological approach. So we're going to look at one more subtopic within the biological approach. Specifically, we're going to look at neurotransmission, which is a topic that people often struggle quite a bit with. Those of you who take biology as well might know a little more background information, but don't worry if you don't, because we're going to simplify it as much as possible and then build it up so that we can make some really great essays. So to begin with, let's start by talking about what neurotransmission actually is. So to know what neurotransmission is, we need to know what neurons are. So neurons are nerve cells. So it's really just a fancy way to say nerve cells, the cells that make up our nervous system. And their whole role is to communicate or transfer messages from one cell to another so that our body knows how to respond to stimuli. So for example, um, if someone puts out their hand for you to shake it, if you're meeting someone new, then you need to have a signal in your brain. So when your eyes perceive that someone's stretching out their hand for you, then you need to, in your brain, have neurons that perceive that visual stimulus and then pass on that message and eventually contact the motor neurons in your arm so that your muscles contract and move, etc. so that you also hold out your hand and you shake the person's hand. So basically all of our behaviors are controlled by nerve cells or neurons. So neurons can be seen as the building blocks of behavior and you're, you'll often see that phrasing. Um, and it can be to both internal changes in the body and external changes that we need to respond to. So that's why neurotransmission is a huge, vast field and it can be related to so many different behaviors and all types of um, actions. So um, you might've seen what a neuron looks like before. So we can see it here on the screen. So at one end, we have the body of the um, neuron. So that's the at the start here. And in, in the middle, you can see the cell nucleus. So all cells need to have a nucleus. Um, so that's just basically the control center of the cell. And then these branches that come out from the cell body are the dendrites. So the dendrites we spoke about in a previous topic. So if you watched my video on neuroplasticity, then you'll recognize this. The dendrites are essentially the little branches that pick up messages from other neurons. So a message will be communicated to them, which will then be received on the dendrites, and then they'll pass down the rest of the neuron. So it'll pass along the axon here, which is the part that are covered in yellow cells, which wrap around the axon. But don't worry about knowing that. All it does is speed up neurotransmission. And then the message passes down to the end here. Um, and at the very end, so these are called terminal branches. And then we have terminal buttons at the end. So terminal buttons is essentially the part where neurotransmitters, so another type of messenger, are released to then pass on to the next neuron, where they'll then pass on to dendrites and kind of start the whole process over. So it goes dendrites, soma, which is the cell body, axon, terminal branches, terminal buttons, and then they pass into the synapse. So that's where the neurotransmitter goes. So the synapse is the gap between two neurons, really. So it's um, the terminal buttons of one where they meet the dendrites of the next neuron. And so what happens is that neurotransmitters are essentially our body's natural chemical messengers. So they will be passed from the terminal buttons to across the synapse then to the next neuron. And like I said, it'll kickstart the next process. Um, but if that neurotransmitter is blocked or changed in any way, then the message will change. So it's a very specific process and it can affect our thoughts, our mood, our behavior, etc. There's so many effects of um, neurotransmitters and that's anything from serotonin to acetylcholine, um, dopamine, uh, noradrenaline, and we'll talk about two of them today. So specifically, we'll talk about acetylcholine and noradrenaline. So let's start by looking at um, one study on this and talking a little more about one of those neurotransmitters. So the first one we'll look at is a study by Martinez and Kessner, and that's to look at acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter which is linked to memory. So it's linked to synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus and plays an important role in learning and in short-term memory. So if you're not too sure about short-term memory, again, we'll cover that more in the cognitive approach. So basically what this means is that Martinez and Kessner wanted to see what it, what role exactly does acetylcholine have in memory. So in short term memory, for example, in forming memories, um, basically wanted to explore that. 
And the way that they chose to do this was through an experiment. So experimentation isn't something that we've talked about yet in any of my videos so far. So rather than just case studies, which are quite specific to one group of people or just one person, then experiments are a much more rigorous scientific method in that you try to create or look for a cause and effect relationship. So you manipulate one variable. So in, in this case, um, or in the case of experiments, you're always manipulating the independent variable to see what effect that'll have on the dependent variable. So the dependent variable, de variable depends on the manipulation of the independent variable. So it's a great way to kind of isolate this cause and effect to see how changing one thing can affect another. So what Martinez and Kessner did is they split a, a, some rats up into three groups. So they had one group, so group one, they received a scopolamine injection. And what that does is it blocks the acetylcholine receptor sites, so on the dendrites of the next neuron. And that basically reduces how much acetylcholine is available um, because it's blocked, right? So we're blocking that neurotransmission. Then group two, they received an injection with physostigmine and that blocks the production of cholinesterase. And what cholinesterase does is it essentially, it's an enzyme that degrades the neurotransmitter. So again, we don't need to worry about the details, but what it does is it increases how much acetylcholine is available because it doesn't break it down. So it stays in the synapse. It's able to attach to the next neuron for longer because it's not kind of removed from the space. So it's just a kind of active for longer. Um, and then the final group was a control group, so they didn't receive an injection of anything. And that's how it is in most studies. We need a control group uh, as kind of like a baseline to compare our findings to. So what they found was that group one, so they received the injection with scopolamine, which reduced acetylcholine, um, they had problems finding their way through the maze and they made more mistakes. Whereas group two, who had more acetylcholine, they ran quickly through the maze and they made very few mistakes and they were actually even quicker than the control group. So, so you can see that's why we need the control group because then we can see they weren't just quicker than group one who was already performing worse than what we'd expect to be normal. They were actually also even better than the control. So that gives us kind of something to, to again, like I said, as like a baseline to compare it to. Um, and so what that allows us to conclude is that we must have different memory capacities depending on acetylcholine. But even there with the phrasing, we have to be careful because technically it's not we, right? We, we just looked at rats. We can't necessarily extend that to ourselves. So even though it does give us an indication that this probably means acetylcholine is involved in memory, we don't actually know if it's the same for humans. So it gives us a starting ground. Um, and off of that, if you do human studies, then we can see whether that holds for other animals than just rats. Um, but then again, remember, it's an experiment, a controlled lab experiment. So that means you can control all other variables, which means you really get to isolate these variables um, that we're interested in. And that means that it's more likely we can make some good conclusions from this. Okay, so that's all about acetylcholine. So there we can see an example of neurotransmission, the neurotransmitter's effect on behavior. So in this case, memory and how much um, memory capacity we have. The next example of neurotransmission that we'll talk about is noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is actually both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. So I like to use the study because you can actually also use it for the topic on hormones. Um, basically, noradrenaline, its role is it's hypothesized to be part of the catecholamine hypothesis, which means that it's just part of the bigger picture of depression. So depression is just theorized to um, basically be controlled and affected by a bunch of hormones and neurotransmitters. So it's just this idea that there's no one neurotransmitter or hormone that specifically controls whether or not you have depression. It's instead kind of a group reaction. So noradrenaline is quite key in that because it's, it's linked to low levels or low levels of it are linked to depression. So in a study by Jarowski et al, they basically did another experiment here, just like what we talked about. So you have an independent variable and a dependent variable, and they chose the independent variable to be noradrenaline and the dependent variable to be depressive symptoms. So they wanted to see if changing noradrenaline levels could have an impact on depressive symptoms. And so now if I were to tell you that this is to do with humans, you might start to think, hmm, how ethical is that? So good question to ask and we'll circle back to that but basically we had two groups so we had a control group who just received a placebo drug 
And then we had group two who received a drug that suppressed noradrenaline. So remember, I said that noradrenaline in low levels is linked to depression. So ethically, this might not be the best study. Just keep that in mind. So what they found was that group one, who were the control group who'd received a placebo, they ended up being more depressed. So they did actually show more depressive symptoms, and some even had depressive symptoms that were long term. So they lasted. So naturally, it's good scientifically that we saw this link here. We were able to, through a lab experiment, control other variables and see how the manipulation of noradrenaline could affect depressive symptoms. So it allowed us to make that conclusion that neurotransmitters like noradrenaline might impact depression, but ethically might not be that great to be inducing depressive symptoms, especially since they were maintained long term for some of the participants. Um, so there's kind of pros and cons to the study, but that's also why it's good to talk about in an essay, because you can really be critical and you can show the examiner that you understand that something might be good for science, but it might not be good ethically, and those need to be weighed up. So good study to use. Um, beyond that as well, sometimes people are interested in looking at that a little further, so that's why you can also use this for the, the hormones um, topic, subtopic. Then you can also talk about a study by Delgado and Moreno. So don't worry if you don't know about this and you also don't have to remember another study name or anything like that. But basically there was a study done, which was a correlational study and to look at the effectiveness of SSRIs. So they're selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So again, don't worry about remembering that. Serotonin is another neurotransmitter um, and that's also theorized to be involved in depression. So if you give someone serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, then what they basically do is they prevent serotonin from being degraded, broken down um, in the synapse, so between two neurons, so instead there's more available. So it's like what we talked about with one of the injections, that um, you basically can prevent it all from being broken down and you can prolong the effects of serotonin. So they're quite effective at treating depression. Um, and what this study found by Delgado and Moreno was that there's a stronger correlation between serotonin and depression than noradrenaline and depression. And the reason I bring this up is that it's good to show awareness when you're talking about a study like this, that this study doesn't mean, even though it's an experiment, that noradrenaline causes depression. It means that noradrenaline is probably involved in depressive symptoms or kind of plays a part, plays a role in depression. So just again, be really careful with that wording. And if you're worried that you're not making it clear enough in your writing, then do add that there is this other body of evidence that shows that serotonin might play a bigger role um, in depressive symptoms. And really there's just a whole bunch of neurotransmitters and that in an imbalance cause or are related to um, depressive symptoms. So altogether, what we can conclude from both these studies and what we've talked about is that there's a whole range of neurotransmitters um, and human behavior can be impacted by all of these in lots of different ways and that behavior is really complex, neurotransmission is really complex, and that's how we get this phenomenon that is human behavior. So I hope you guys learned something new today as well and I hope you come back for the next video. Until then, feel free to check out our team of absolutely incredible tutors. Go to the Lanterna website or click the link below, um, and then you'll be able to get OPT, so online private tuition, with either myself or one of our other tutors um, in a subject of your choosing. So if you're interested in that, follow the link, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.